Good morning. I'm Diego Lopez Garrido, the executive vice president of the Fundación Alternativas, which is a, a progressive and independent think tank, a Spanish think tank. On March the 21st, um, South Africa commemorates the so-called Human Rights Day. Two days uh, later, we are here uh, with the collaboration of uh, South African Embassy to discuss on the state of human rights worldwide um, in the current situation, in the pandemic uh, situation. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador of South Africa in Spain, Tenjibe Ethel Metinzo. I, I, sorry for the pronunciation. And thank you to Professor Inge, Ingebe uh, Kise, uh, to Fernando Fernandez Arias, uh, to Reverendo Bafana Kumalo, thank you to Elsa Aime Gonzalez. The next speakers. The speakers uh, will talk uh, on the economic and social impact of COVID-19 on human rights, especially gender rights. The 2020 pandemic has made inequality worse. Following your times, now for every 100 people in the world, only five have received a shot, creating a kind of uh, global vaccine apartheid. Only about uh, one in four people coming from the lo lower income countries can expect a shot this year. Then a major public health concern has impacted nearly every aspect of workers' right, produced uh, the stagnation of living standards um, and uh, migratory flows, for example, from Africa, not only from Africa, but from Africa as well. And uh, instead of opening the door, many Western governments are double locking it in the words of The Economist. As uh, Guido Raimondi, president of the European Court of Human Rights says, for the younger generations, automatic support for the idea of human rights is no longer a given. The European Parliament uh, envisages many structural risks in a study published uh, the last uh, year. Risk for uh, the world and mainly in Europe, post uh, the Europe, the post coronavirus Europe. Based in this um, study, I'd like to emphasize two big problems. In my opinion, probably the, the most relevant problems in the world, uh, which is the child poverty and the violence against the women. Given that the, the children are the population with uh, the highest at risk of poverty rate, there is a need for a rapid scaling up in support for children whose families income is insecure and to provide the social protection they deserve to avoid damage to children's future. Gender inequality, the other big, big problem. Persistent inequalities and gender gaps in poverty, employment, pay, representation in decision-making, 
and exposure to gender-based violence remain. In Africa and in Europe, Ambassador, abuse and violence against women and children have escalated. Following Gravio, Gravio is a council of uh, Europe's group of experts on combating violence against women and domestic violence. Grevio has identified a number of priority areas in which the authorities should take measures. It would be, it would be necessary uh, following Grevio, I repeat, it's, uh, it would be necessary to continue and to intensify efforts to advance the jury and de facto gender equality, establish legal measures to protect women from economic violence, continue efforts to eliminate discrimination, which increases the risk of exposure to violence and hinders access to protection mechanisms for women from groups subject to multiple discrimination, such as young women, women living in rural areas, elderly women, women from the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community, and women with disabilities. Intensifying training measures for all professionals, including staff who come into contact with women asylum seekers, and to take the necessary legislative or other measures to protect victims of forced marriages. To end, I'd like to uh, make a, a short statement. Human rights, human rights are best maintained by an effective political democracy. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, Ambassador, you have the floor. Well, uh... Deputy Minister Shengi Wemkize, Director General Fernando Fernandez Arias, Mr. Diego Lopez Garrido, Reverend Bafana Kumalo, Excellencies, distinguished participants. Buenos dias a todos. Welcome to the South African Human Rights Day celebration, co hosted by the South African Embassy in Spain and the Fundacion Alternativas in honor of those who fought for South Africa's liberation and as a commitment to the promotion and defense of human rights for all. COVID-19 has accentuated the pre-existing inequalities and has exposed vulnerabilities in our social, political and economic systems. The UN Secretary General, Senor Antonio Guterres maintains, I quote, the pandemic has demonstrated the fragility of our world. It is exposing the myth that we are all in the same boat. Because while we are all floating on the same sea, it's clear that some of us are in super yachts, while others are clinging to the floating debris, close quote. Those clinging to the floating debris are mainly women, the youth, this disabled, LGBTIQ plus community, the poor, and those who live in rural areas in Africa, in the so-called developing and underdeveloped world, and in the margins of the so-called developed world. In South Africa, COVID-19 has exacerbated the crisis created by apartheid of racial divisions, poverty, inequality, and unemployment impacting most negatively on African women, girls, and those living with disabilities, especially in the rural and in the informal areas. Spain has passed a law to protect women, women's jobs in the post-pandemic era. And hopefully South Africa, Africa, and others can also have similar protection for women. Under COVID-19, gender-based violence and femicide has also reached pandemic levels. It is reported that in the past year, over 243 million women and girls were sexually and or physically violated. 
Many women continue to be locked down at home with their abusers. At a time when services to support survivors are inaccessible. Our discussions today will focus both on the impact of COVID-19 on the rights of especially the already marginalized groups and will explore socio-economic recoveries that will not take us back to the pre-COVID-19 inhumane and unjust world. I think that uh, my, 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 my other speakers already referred to this. Hopefully all of us, irrespective of our race, class, gender, age, sexual orientation, rich or poor, developed or underdeveloped, will today resolve to work together to protect human rights and save lives, guided by the, value, by the African values of Ubuntu, humanness, and the understanding of our interconnectedness and interdependence based on the ethos of umtu, ngumtu, ngabantu. You are because I am, and I am because you are. With Ubuntu, Spain, the EU, and the whole of the so-called developed world have to support the call made by South Africa, India, and other developing countries for the temporal waiver of the WTO trips. This waiver can facilitate rapid scaling up of production by multiple producers across all countries, sharing and transferring knowledge and technology in the fight against COVID-19 and for the protection of human rights and saving of human lives. Otherwise, many countries will be unable to access vaccines leading to what South Africa's Archbishop Tabo Mkhoba calls the vaccine apartheid, which uh, Diego has just referred to. No one is safe until we are all safe. And we have to put human life above profits. Let me thank all the speakers for their participation in this event, the Fundacion Alternativas for their support and collaboration, and those who have joined in Gracias a todos por su apoyo. Special gratitude to the veteran artist Dunokwe and Bikos Mana, who will be giving us just a taste of South Africa with their performance. Dunokwe's Safe Home project is aimed at helping abused women and children in South Africa and is driven by her passion to defend social justice and human rights. Nkosi Dunokwe Nabandwa. Por favor, disfrute de la celebración del mes de los derechos humanos en Sudáfrica. Un país muy hermoso. Muchas gracias. Thank you. This is Biko and Mana. They are Biko's Mana from Amajibai Youth Arts and Life. I'm Junogwe. Hey, Tada! Yeah, bye. 
¿Empiezo ya? ¿Empiezo ya? Pero no veo a nadie más. So, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for those um, beautiful opening remarks and particularly the, the performance. I think it's always better no, to... Uh, well, discuss and, and fight for uh, human rights when we have um, the support of uh, music and, and musicians. No? Um, so we are going to uh, open the debate on this topic today. Um, uh, let me introduce me first. I'm Elsa M. Gonzalez, uh, coordinator of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa Research Panel here at uh, Fundación Alternativas. And we will have today uh, for this discussion, um, first, uh, Dr. Lengui um, Kize, uh, South Africa's Deputy Minister for Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. Uh, then we will have the opportunity to hear and discuss with uh, uh, Mr. Fernando Fernandez Arias, General Director for the United Nations International Organizations and Human Rights at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, uh, lastly, we will have the opportunity to listen to Reverend Bafane Kumalo, who is co-founder of the Sonke Gender Justice um, Organization. Um, so I'm going to give you the floor, 10 minutes to each one of you. Um, I will ask you please to stick to that time so we will have uh, some time for a further debate later, uh, issues that may arise uh, from your presentations and with the public. We have now 
um, um, uh, 50, approximately 50 person um, uh, following this debate on Zoom and more people on uh, the other channels, YouTube and so on. So um, I will ask you to um, stick to that time so we save time for the, for the debate later. So thank you very much. And, and Dr. Um, Kize, the floor is yours, or the screen, better say. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I would like to acknowledge Mr. Fernando Fernandez Arias, the Director General for the UN International Organizations and Human Rights at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the U European Union and Cooperation. Also, I would like to acknowledge the excellent Ambassador Fabian Tiso, our leader, revolutionary, and agenda activist. I would also like to acknowledge Mr. Diego Lopez Carrito, Executive Vice President of Fundacion Alternatives. Uh, Your Excellency, I would like to also uh, acknowledge all South Africans in a meeting, all protocol observed. I also would like to affirm the importance of the partnership as has been described so far. It's very, very important to have the voice of civil society in the room. We acknowledge the role played by Fundacion Alternativas other civil society organizations and development partners, including those in our midst. We know that's what keeps governments under scrutiny. The work done by the foundation think tank is a mass-based democratic formation discussing issues of interest to citizens. And we can relate to that given our history in South Africa where we toppled the apartheid regime through the revolution. Uh, grassroots revolution. Today, as it has been said, we are reflecting on the Human Rights Day of South Africa. I think I won't, I would be repeating myself if I, I go into details about the day in the discussion, uh, it will emerge, but basically the South African apartheid government then responded to an innocent protest by killing people brutally killing people in numbers. More than 69 unarmed citizens were killed by the police on that day, including 10 children. More than 180 people were wounded, including 19 children. These were people fighting for their basic human rights. But the gain out of all this is that it triggered a debate at the UN uh, uh, General uh, Council and in that, from that debate, we then had the, the United Nations in 1973, the UN Security Council, adopting a resolution which declared apartheid a crime against humanity. And that triggered a revolution which uh, mobilized the whole world against the apartheid regime. And ultimately, in 1994, we saw our democracy. And of course, on the question of human rights, it's important to reflect that it's important for us to always be vigilant and not to lower our guts because sometimes even in democracy, uh, the, uh, the, the, the brutality, the violation of human rights tends to show its brutality. Also the partnership between uh, the cordial relations between the government of Spain and the government of South Africa are really uh, welcomed. We appreciate these warm relationships. We've seen some benefits. Uh, like in 2020, Spain invited South Africa to be one of the 21 members uh, states to support group to the International Commission Against Death Penalty, whose secretariat is based in Madrid. Spain has also worked closely with South Africa during its membership of the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And so such relationships is the question of saying what next. We live through difficult times as most speakers have said so far. The global pandemic caused by COVID-19 has brought turmoil and suffering right across the world. The World Health Organization and the UN have been vocal about the risk of access to vaccinations to be an exclusive privilege of developed countries. Defenders of human rights cannot turn a blind eye we should nip these tendencies in the bud. In September 2020, the WHO announced its distribution plan for COVID-19 vaccine to push back on the emerging notion 
of the vaccine nationalism, meaning each country should prioritize its own uh, citizens. If there is one lesson we have learned from this pandemic, it has laid bare existing inequalities and violations of human rights have deepened. In April 2020, the UN Secretary General stated that COVID-19 is a crisis with a woman's face. The pandemic has and continues to worsen inequalities facing women and girls. It has reversed many of the gains women have made towards quality and the promotion and protection of their rights. During this pandemic, we have already heard that uh, there has been a global outcry that violence against women and girls have increased. Access to services, care, treatment, and response were impeded by the restriction imposed by lockdowns. Women were in lockdown in close confines with their perpetrators. Hence, it is said we, women are in a double uh, pandemic. I just want to touch quickly on where we are today, economic recovery and restructuring for post COVID-19. While we are in a pandemic, we have to strategically start thinking about how we address the imbalances of the past. Our history and experiences must motivate us to do better, to build better and to foster greater alliances for participation of women, youth and persons with disabilities in everyday life. We cannot ignore the plight of rural women and all other marginalized uh, group. We must draw our past and our collective strengths to be able to defeat the challenges that continue to come our way. Rebuilding the economy and structuring it differently calls for resilience, determination, and zeal, which drove all revolutions. In 2018, at the 10th extraordinary summit of the AU, Almost all African countries signed the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, thereby creating the largest free trade area in the world. The agreement connects 55 countries and 1.3 billion people across the continent with a combined GDP of economies valued at 3.4 uh, US trillion. We see this as a game changer in our resolve for an inclusive, economy and financial inclusion of marginalized group. In conclusion, we should, now, we should not overlook the potential of building the human rights culture, which, which the abundance of technology can help us to realize. So many benefits can be derived from technology if we can all be duty bound, monitoring it closely, so as not to widen the gap between the haves and the have nots. Access to internet is critical. However, new entrants to the web will not enjoy the benefits without a supportive foundation to use it. There might be tight regulations of the digital economy to create a healthy competitive environment for businesses, institutions to enable em empowerment of citizens and skills to help users to navigate the internet. At this year, the UN will be launching the Global Generation Equality Campaign towards gender equality by 2030. On this new era, we bring the generation equality coalitions on different priority issues, including to defend and be champions of human rights. Let us remember that the adolescent 15-year-old girl today is the core focus of generation equality. In 2030, she'll be 25 years old. We're thinking about a young woman for whom the world should be fairer than, equitable, non-discriminatory, and one in which she's empowered and emancipated. She's a leader in her own right and can, and can take care, active part in decision-making. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mkise. And um, after these first thoughts, we are going to give the floor to Fernando Fernandez Arias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elsa, and a good day to everybody who are listening to, to us. Uh, Deputy Minister Mkise, Reverend Pakama Kumalu, 
uh, a, a big thank to Ambassador Matinsto for inviting me uh, to participate in this event and of course to the Executive uh, Vice President Diego López Garrido of Fundación Alternativas. It is a real honor to celebrate together with all of you uh, 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 South Africa's uh, Human Rights Day today. Um, 17 years ago, almost to the day, on 1994, I was still a much younger man than I am today. And I was one of the many international observers sent by the United Nations to supervise the elections in South Africa. I went to South Africa for the first time and I saw an absolutely extraordinary country with, uh, with landscapes that one could never imagine if one has never seen them in, uh, in the flesh. I was posted as an observer in a rather remote region. And then all of a sudden it struck me, uh, there were two South Africas. There was a developed South Africa filled with people with light skin like, uh, like mine. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, uh, beyond this wealth, beyond this well-being, um, there was another world. There was another world where people uh, had darker skin and there was no running water, there was no electricity, uh, there, was, there were no roads. Uh, it was a completely different situation from what I could see from the other side. And yet we were in the same country and yet we were in front of people whose only difference uh, despite their wealth, was their skin color. And uh, that struck a chord immediately with me. Uh, having been a part, uh, a very small part, I, I, I have to say, because I was just one of thousands, but having been a small part of that big effort to put an end to apartheid is one of the greatest things that I have done in my life, that I've done in, in all my more than 30 years of career as, um, as a diplomat, and it's something that I will never, ever uh, uh, forget. I remember that at the time at the United Nations, the seat right next to us, the seat of South Africa was empty. And from then on, that seat has always been uh, the seat of South Africa. And we have been working for these uh, 27 years now, hand in hand, together on so many fronts, be it human rights, be it whatever it is that we discuss at the United Nations, we have always worked uh, uh, together. Today, we recall uh, uh, the, uh, the events in, in Sharpfield in 1966, where the General Assembly called, when the, when the, after which the General Assembly said that racial discrimination is an offense to human dignity. And as it was stated later, and as Deputy Minister Mkise reminded us, it was uh, stated and declared a crime against humanity, something that the Statute of Rome or the International Criminal Court, which lists uh, uh, which gives the definition in Article 7 of crimes against humanity, includes the crime of, uh, of apartheid. I want to con congratulate South Africa for all that the country has done between that day in 1994 and that day long, long time ago, more than 60 years, uh, more than 50 years ago in 1966 until uh, today. And I also want to congratulate South Africa for having been the leader in uh, promoting the fight against racial discrimination. Uh, uh, in 1968, the United Nations adopted the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination on Grounds on Racial Discrimination. However, in, uh, uh, on, in 2001, uh, the Durban Conference started uh, a process, you know, the, um, with the Declaration and Platform of Action to prevent, combat and eradicate racism. However, you know, progress, even though it has happened, progress is never is never enough in, in, in this front. And today we find a resurgence of racial discrimination, manifestations of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerances in all spheres of, of life especially in social media. Social media is a wonderful tool and, uh, and technological development, which allows us to host this conference the way we are doing it, you know, having a big outreach and with everybody being able to, to watch us and to listen to us. Uh, but despite all this, you know, social media, as we know, is uh, uh, helping uh, with the rapid um, speed, uh, with rapid spread, sorry, of, of racist uh, uh, discourse by, by, by the public in general, and also by some political and social movements. In addition, as Diego Lopez Garrido stated at the beginning of his, of his presentation, the COVID-19 uh, health crisis has, uh, which affects the whole world, has only contributed 
contributed to accelerate the vulnerability of those individuals who are already exposed to this vicious circle of uh, racism, discrimination, and uh, poverty. There are obviously uh, uh, structural, there is structural, persistent structural racism, which in addition to this unusual backdrop uh, has exacerbated inequalities in access to uh, basic uh, uh, services such as employment, education, healthcare, and, uh, and housing. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 in the enjoyment of human rights all over the world is, um, is, is huge. It is something that has been discussed at the Human Rights Council, the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, which has revealed glaring disparities in the enjoyment of human rights amongst the uh, uh, population. Um, and this pandemic has uh, obviously a disproportionate impact on uh, on women and, and girls as a whole. In terms of, of employment, it is the areas of activities such as care, retail, hospitality, tourism, where the percentage of, uh, of female employment is uh, is uh, is highest and because of the jobs they've been doing or the jobs they do they are at greater risk of contracting the uh, uh, virus um, there's been also a sharp inc increase in gender-based violence because of the lockdown situation uh, in which many way women find themselves together with those with those men who uh, uh, attack her and who act violently against them uh, i'll speak very briefly about what we have been doing uh, uh, Spain uh, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, we have always tried uh, to guarantee a sustainable and transformative uh, recovery, giving always priority to human rights and paying special attention to the impact of the health emergency, uh, the, the health emergency has in uh, women and girls. We have recently adopted a feminist foreign policy and within it, we want to achieve gender equality and uh, we want to increase our efforts finding uh, COVID-19. Uh, 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 also always through multilateralism because we believe that multilateralism has a direct effect on the lives of individuals. And that's why together with South Africa last November, our pre presidents, uh, Prime Minister Sanchez and President Barnforsa uh, launched together with all the presidents, heads of state and government, this uh, group of leaders uh, uh, to uh, give further impulse to uh, the multilateral uh, efforts in, um, in the world. We have a new uh, plan, a solidarity vaccination uh, universal access plan, whose main objective, which was passed in last January by the Spanish government, whose main objective is to contribute to the vaccination of significant percentage of the world's population by supporting rapid access to a vaccine for countries and people with the greater uh, difficulty in uh, doing so. We are working through various channels uh, COVAX, which is the main mechanism for the distribution of vaccines, helping also through the European Union and through United Nations agencies such, such as uh, OCHA, in uh, especially humanitarian uh, context, context of humanitarian uh, uh, difficulties, but also through bilateral allocation. And we have made, we are creating a strategic reserve, which is established for unforeseen needs. Uh, uh, um, also, we are the co-leaders of the uh, what is known as the ACT Accelerator, which is articulated through the COVAX facility. It's an initiative led by uh, Gavi, which is the International uh, Vaccine uh, Alliance, and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, preparedness uh, Innovation. With this COVAX, through, through the COVAX facility, we have already allocated 50 million euros to the advanced market commitment through Gavi, and we have also approved uh, an additional financial contribution for 75 million. Um, this is our contribution uh, to avoid what has been already labeled by those who spoke before me as uh, vaccine uh, apartheid. But I want to uh, uh, finish uh, uh, commending South Africa 
on uh, its uh, human rights uh, record. Um, we share a lot of priorities. Uh, Minister, Deputy Minister Mkise was mentioning the abolition of death penalty, but, but death penalty, but there are also other issues such as the uh, end of uh, discrimination on grounds on sexual orientation and uh, gender identity. South Africa is one of the great champions of LGBTI rights in, uh, in the world. And of course, gender equality and something that's very deep to my heart, which is the women, peace and security agenda. During our membership, our last membership of the Security Council in uh, uh, 19, sorry, 2015, 2016, we focused very strongly on the women, peace and security agenda. And South Africa did the same in last previous two years in, nine, in 2019 and uh, 2020. South Africa is a key player on, on this field in, uh, in, uh, within the African uh, continent. And uh, we want to be also a key player in, uh, in Europe. I'm going to finish by um, uh, remembering um, the words of, uh, of Desmond Tutu who said he was not interested in the crumbs of compassion uh, uh, from other countries. He wanted the full menu of human rights. And I think this is something that we can all relate to. And this is something that we all, that we all want for ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando, for your reflection on, on this uh, issue of human rights in a time of crisis, and particularly those uh, closing words uh, from uh, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu. And now, third intervention by Reverend Bafana Kumalo. Please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Gonzalez, uh, uh, Madam Ambassador. <laughs> Mtinso, Deputy Minister, thank um, uh, of, of uh, the Department of Women in South Africa, <clears throat> uh, all protocol observed. Uh, colleagues, uh, thanks to my fellow uh, panelists who have already outlined some of the key issues that require our attention as we focus on the need to strengthen the human rights culture in our countries. <clears throat> the outbreak of COVID-19, as we all know, posed a very serious challenge to the world for development agenda and will most certainly impact negatively on gender outcomes. This requires all institutions to develop pragmatic response initiatives. My organization, Sonke, and the consortium I'm part of, known as Men Engage, we have been exploring mechanisms and strategies that will help mitigate against the challenges that are posed by this pandemic. As many countries around the world take measures to curtail the spread of COVID-19, the direct relationship between the pandemic and the rising levels of gender inequality and gender-based violence can never be overlooked. Every sector of society, be it government, business, civil society organizations, the faith and traditional leaders, communities, as well as individuals, all have a role to play to prevent the further repression of women and girls during this period. This repression, which in most instances exacerbates gender, social, and economic challenges. Since the global outbreak of the coronavirus, which ensue, saw us uh, ensuing a lot of lockdowns in many countries, have seen huge increases in different forms of sexual and gender-based violence abuses, including intimate partner violence. Alongside deepening socioeconomic factors, restrictions of movement and isolation, there has been the rise of what our president calls the second pandemic, which is that of gender-based violence and femicides. Whilst women are forced to be under lockdown with their abusers, services offered in support of intimate partner violence 
and domestic violence remain inaccessible and disrupted. These multiple layers have exacerbated in light of competing limited resources, services and government response to the pandemic. Beyond its tragic human toll, the coronavirus pandemic has triggered unprecedented economic toil across the globe. Due to economic shutdowns caused by the fight against the virus, millions of jobs have been lost as thousands of businesses have been forced to close down and many others are at risk of experiencing a similar fate sooner rather than later. This social and economic disruption has led to a number of challenges, including food insecurity for poor and vulnerable households. And as we know, in many of our societies, when economies are constrained, it is women who face the brunt because women often care not for themselves first, but for their families, for their communities, for their children. All institutions, therefore, and organizations are challenged by this pandemic and its impact on livelihoods, challenge on our health system, challenge on the economic activities. Current evidence indicates that this pandemic will be with us for a while until a cure vaccine is discovered and is ably accessible to all communities. Consequently, we all have to be ready and ensure that our institutions are ready to respond to this global challenge. There can be no doubt as to the fact that this will impact on the programs that we do for those of us who are within working in civil society. Sonke therefore and Men Engage are currently adapting our programs so that we are able to learn what science is presenting to us regarding this pandemic and developing innovative response mechanisms so that we are able both to protect our staff, but to save jobs and ensure that we continue to provide needed support to the communities that we serve. Anecdotal evidence shows that teenage pregnancies in many countries have increased significantly during the COVID-19 era. In many of these countries, it points to the fact that access to sexual reproductive health and rights services has been intermittent during the high pressure on the struggling health systems. In response, many countries have put up what we call stimulus packages, which have been rolled out in order to try and mitigate and alleviate the impact of the economic turmoil. For example, in South Africa, we know that our government uh, launched a 500 billion intervention, which was available both to businesses and to individuals to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 during the lockdown period. And, and in order to alleviate the impact of what this has done to the economy. And the Solidarity Fund, which is also an institution that has been established to work with government in trying to find uh, mitigating factors in dealing with this challenge has worked in four ways in an attempt to meet the challenge that we are facing at the moment. First is preventing the spread of infection by supporting campaigns and com communication measures to ensure that we flatten the curve of, of COVID-19. Secondly, detecting and understanding the magnitude of the disease through the supply of testing kits and research. And thirdly, caring for those in hospital or on medical care by ensuring a continuous supply of PPEs, personal protective care equipment. And these interventions have been very, very useful during this period. Of pivotal interest, of course, is the support component, which emphasizes the humanitarian effort as one of the three immediate areas of focus for the disbursement of funds donated by South Africans 
to the Solidarity Fund. To provide accelerated aid for South Africa's most vulnerable households and communities during the COVID-19 pandemic, the humanitarian effort focuses on promoting human welfare through augmenting the efforts of government and business to enhance the household's ability to cope through the pandemic through sustaining access to food, care, and other interventions to alleviate the impact of economic disruption. In Kenya, President Uhuru Kenyatta announced a stimulus package designed to help the counties through the pandemic, through similar related measures as we have seen in my country, South Africa. This included tax breaks, economic and monetary adjustments, and limited social measures to curb the spread of the virus. While the provision of stimulus packages, particularly a relief for poor and vulnerable communities is welcome relief, it is imperative to assess what impact the distribution of these packages could have, not only on alleviating food shortages, but also in terms of addressing gender-based violence. At Sonke uh, with Men Engage, we have thus embarked on a study, a study that is looking at stimulus, stimulus packages that are offered within our region, to what extent these are cascading to address the most vulnerable in our society. Anecdotal evidence already shows that majority of these packages sadly have been going to the established businesses and very little trickling down to people on the ground. And we think this is a matter that needs to be addressed so that indeed the intervention can have the necessary impact for those that are most vulnerable in our society. Despite the fact that GBV cuts across all geographic and socioeconomic status, it is usually the poor that face the disproportionate high risks of gender-based violence. And therefore poverty-related stress and economic insecurity correlate with poor coping strategies such as substance abuse that can lead to increase in intimate partner violence and child maltreatment. Additionally, we've seen more women losing their jobs during COVID. As we all know, most women work in vulnerable sectors and are also in the informal sector. So with the lockdown conditions, these businesses have been hard hit and the stimulus packages need to consider these factors as they are rolled out so that we find the necessary balance for those that are most vulnerable. We argue that we also need to fast track and increase investments in women and young people, particularly in education, so that we enhance their participation in the economy. Men Engage, as I conclude, remains committed to support the SDGs agenda and to seek to contribute to the advancement of the Generation Equality Initiative. To this end, we engage in advancing what we call positive masculinities, campaigning for positive parenting, including extension of parental leave, and getting more men engaged in care work. It is our argument that when we get more men taking part in care work, this alleviates the huge burden that women have to carry, especially in moments like in COVID, where they have to now not only care for themselves, but care for the whole household, leaving very little room for their own leisure, for them to also can focus on their own development. And this we believe it's important. And in our intervention that includes working hard with our partners to end the scourge of harmful practices like FGM and child marriages so that we indeed create an environment where women can participate in the economy freely without fear, but also feeling emboldened that they are respected and treated with dignity in the societies from which they come from. I thank you. So thank you very much, Reverend Kumalu, for those um, thoughts and reflections, <coughs> uh, more particularly, you know, 
uh, women and, and well, the less favorable uh, levels of society you know, are facing the, the situation right now. Um, we have, as a way to open the debate, um, uh, what we call in Spain uh, zero row. Uh, so we would like to invite um, Antumi Tuasije, who is the president for the Council for the Elimination of Racial or Ethnic Discrimination here in Spain, um, to open the floor um, uh, for the debate. Uh, I would like at the same time to remind you there are already some questions that have been um, uh, asked here in the in the chat you have below uh, for typing your um, questions and uh, we will address them uh, during the the debate we have something like 15 minutes for for the debate and we will close uh, today webinar um, with some more music but before that let's discuss a little bit on on human rights in a time of crisis so and to me here you are the the floor is yours for for this uh, first reflection Thank you, Elsa. As it has been said, I'm the president of the Council for the Elimination of Racial or Ethnic Discrimination in Spain. It's an institution linked to the Ministry of Equality. And I want to congratulate the Fundación Alternativas and the South African Embassy in Spain for hosting this relevant event. Thanks to all the participants for sharing, sharing the views with us. And thanks to the South African nation for the great engagement in the fight against racism. <clears throat> the recent uh, commemoration of the 21st of March shows us that racism is a structural, thus institutional problem. Our latest uh, report, Perception of Discrimination for Racial or Ethnic uh, Profile by the Potential Victims in 2020, shows an increase of the racist incidents linked to the pandemic but also linked with the emerging of far-right political discourses, normalizing racist and xenophobic ideologies. The conjunction of social crisis and irresponsible political discourses worries us in the Council. In regard of this, there is an apparent challenge, the needed balance between freedom of speech and the rise of ideologies that harms various vulnerable sectors of the population, by normalizing uh, hate arguments. Hate speech legis legislations seems to be insufficient to uh, prevent this uh, leading to the claim of more restrictive legislation against neo-Nazi and anti-democratic symbols and manifestations. So my question is, is there any recommendation South African can share with us to counteract this situation? Thank you. Let me thank you very much, Antumi, uh, for this um, first reflection and opening the floor. And uh, well, maybe we can start the debate from here and then we will take um, further, further questions that have been asked and I will, I, I will raise them. So I don't know if somebody wants to address um, the question, no? Uh, Antumi was um, asking particularly what lessons, no? Can, could we... Could we learn from the South African experience in terms of containing, combating, confronting um, racist uh, policies and, and political currents no, that we are witnessing across Europe? In the meantime, I will, I will raise this other question that was um, asked by uh, Barry James Mitchell. Um, who was particularly, you know, addressing or something that asking uh, about something that has been addressed by um, uh, all guest speakers. Um, particularly, the question is how South Africa can use, you know, the upcoming G7, that, uh, of which it has been invited to, to strengthen the notion of solidarity with regards to equitable vaccine rollout and um, how Spain can act in solidarity in this regard with nations that are pursuing a more equitable rollout um, of the vaccine. Thank you, Barry, for, for your question as well. I am happy to, 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 to break the ice and start. Thank you, Fernando. I, um, 
we, we all learned a lot from South Africa and from the South African uh, 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 struggle for, for, for rights. I mean, coincided in time also for the fight for civil rights in the United States in the late 60s, the beginning of the struggle after the, 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 the massacre we've all mentioned uh, in, in, in South Africa. And, and two of the most important things that we all learned was um, the first one is grassroots resistance. And this is very important. If there is no movement from the grassroots, beginning from the bottom up, you know, um, um, it is not likely that there will be a reply and that there will be a uh, result in the fight for any any rights. I mean, um, it's always, I always say, you know, I work for government. I am a civil servant. I've always worked for government. I have worked half of my career on human rights, but I always say the same. It is grassroots organization, it is civil society that knows exactly what needs to be done because they are the ones in need. They are the ones who are fighting for their, for their rights and they're the ones who tell us what public policies we have to carry on. So grassroots resistance is the first thing. And the second one is peaceful resilience. Peaceful is absolutely fundamental. If you don't do things by peaceful means, you know, your cause will not be addressed. But at the same time, you have to be resilient. You know, Nelson Mandela was an example for all of us. You know, he spent decades in prison and yet, you know, he's still a symbol. Uh, uh, for the fight for human rights, for the fight for freedom, for the fight for human dignity in uh, in the world. So I think that that is one of the things that uh, we have all, all of us who deal with human rights, who are interested in, in in human issues, to put it that way. This is what we've learned from uh, from South Africa, and this is something that we have to be uh, incredibly thankful for. Can address the other issue about what we've been doing. You know, I've explained a little bit uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the vaccine. Something that I haven't said, but which I can say uh, uh, right now is that um, um, it is uh, the the issue of vaccination is very sensitive for all countries, even for us. Public opinions. Um, I mean, bear in mind that in Spain, only five percent of the population have received the full vaccination, and another five percent have received has received the first shot. So we're still on pretty low figures uh, um, when it comes to the process of vaccination, not immunization, because unfortunately, a high percentage of the uh, of the population, more than ten percent of the population, has been infected by the virus, and they have antibodies. They have a um, uh, 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 a natural, to put it that way, way of immunization and not not a vaccine. But still, there's a lot to uh, uh, to be done. And one of the problems is that any time that we try to roll out uh, a program of assistance of, of cooperation in the world of vaccines. Uh, there is a, a resistance uh, from uh, from public opinion. You know, okay, yes, we do this first for ourselves and then for the rest of the world. This is not something unique to my country. It's something that's happened uh, everywhere. However, however, those of us who are in charge of public policies, we. Um, for once, we do not listen fully to uh, our public opinion because we know that it is fundamental to uh, help those in need who are actually, in fact, more in need than we are because our health services, our public health services can cope with uh, a pandemic. So far, they have been able to cope, but this is not the case for most developing countries. So we, uh, that's why we are rolling out this uh, program through international organizations or mechanisms such as COVAX, but also uh, creating this um, reserved uh, 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 fund, uh, to, to, to call it like, like, like that, of vaccines that we are using, that we are exporting and sending to our development partners. Thank you, Fernando, for, for breaking the ice, as you said, and um, addressing those two questions. Um, I've seen, I just see that uh, Reverend Kamalo has uh, opened the meet, so I assume. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, add on what uh, my colleague Fernando has said. Uh, it's quite gratifying for us in the South to hear, you know, the comments he has made. Of course, um, our country has been pushing even at WTO for, you know, the relook on this issue of access to vaccines around issues of IPOs. Um, we do think that uh, it will be helpful for, you know, progressive countries to join this um, because we don't think this is the time uh, for big companies to, you know, be focusing on profits 
when the world is so vulnerable and particularly poor countries are struggling uh, with uh, COVID infections. We have uh, the, the virus mutating, putting even more pressure uh, on countries that don't have resources. Uh, it would really help that you know more countries come to the party, support the initiative, so that indeed technology can be made available, you know, for the sake of uh, uh, human beings in the world. We think that that will be helpful. Um, it's 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 also important to note that civil society has been pushing for this. Uh, in South Africa, we have a very vibrant civil society voice that continues to engage with our partners globally so that indeed we, we get a, you know, a positive response from particularly developed countries uh, for this technology uh, to be shared and uh, to ensure that there's access to these much needed vaccines. We don't think it makes sense you know, to simply concentrate these vaccines to uh, developed countries. We are living in a global community. You know? uh, coronavirus has taught us one thing that we are in this one ship together. You know, it doesn't make sense to simply concentrate on one section of the boat and leave the rest. All it means is that we are not going to get rid of, of, of COVID. So our interventions need to be comprehensive, needs to include everybody and ensure that there's accessibility for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Kumalo. And, uh, I'm sure we all agree with uh, this reflection no, and this need no, of, of uh, working together in, in, in that regard. Um, Dr. McKise, you turn uh, reflections on those issues, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, as the colleagues have um, uh, said, in South Africa, through our own apartheid experiences, I think we have learned that um, even post uh, the oppressive regime, even in democracy, racism, uh, intolerance, and different forms of discrimination against the other tends to find its ugly face in our systems. But uh, what has been important for us is to really go through little uh, redrafting of the legislation. You remember that in our case, racism was uh, legislated. So basically it was cushioned uh, in that authority, the, 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 the law of the country. Uh, but at the same time, we uh, continue to encourage civil society all the time to be vigilant, to speak out and to be the voice. Uh, because a new threat like that of immigrants, asylum seekers, and many other vulnerable people. So we, we continue to work very hard within the human rights doctrine, ensuring that uh, our constitution uh, it determines the relationship amongst people uh, in society. And of course, we are also investing in young people in our schools, uh, helping them to understand uh, subtle forms of racism. Uh, as I've said, we come from an era of crude uh, racism uh, to subtle forms where you know, you know, depriving people of their rights, uh, like economic inclusion, reinforce. Uh, racial power, uh, one group dominating the economy, one group uh, running the country and, and leaving uh, the majority of citizens only with political power. Uh, there was uh, another question as to how the, the notion of solidarity with regards to equitable vaccine uh, rollout. Uh, from Mr. Michel, I think it's a very, very important question. Uh, it's an opportunity as well that President Ramaphosa, having taken a clear stance uh, when it comes to access to vaccine, not to represent South Africa, but to represent the continent as the world, 
I'm calling for a global community to stand in solidarity and ensure that nobody is left behind. So he's the ideal person to really give the numbers in terms of statistics of people who have been affected and the reality of struggling even to uh, give vaccines to frontline workers. Uh, we are struggling to give to all health workers, the police, all the frontline workers, the teachers, uh, public representatives. Uh, and so it's a, it's a real challenge that as a global community, we should uh, engage upon and find, uh, and find each other as to how to deal with anxieties about our own security in our individual countries, but also begin to think strategically about what will be a real solution uh, to uh, the problems of COVID-19. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mkise, for, for this reflection. And, um, well, there is another question that has been raised no, by Motlale um, uh, Mokine uh, asking, um, are there efforts or plans to mitigate uh, vaccine apartheid within South Africa? And uh, they, say, they say, I'm thinking about the vulnerable as mentioned by most panelists. No? So how is the, the vaccination program no, uh, unfolding in, in South Africa? And um, are there you know, possibilities precisely to try to reach those that are suffering the, the most? I would add here, I was reading you know, on my way coming to the webinar that uh, one of the challenges uh, you know, that the, the international society is, is facing is not only the fact that there are uh, very clear obstacles you know, for the uh, countries of the global south to have equal access to the vaccines, but further they are being asked to pay more. No? And it was um, in, in this information I was reading on my way here, uh, they were saying, whereas in, in, in Europe and the Western world, we are paying something like $2.15 a shot. Um, countries in the global south are being required to pay more than the double, no, almost uh, $5.25. So um, this issue of the vaccine apartheid is a problem worldwide and, of course, as well sometimes um, uh, locally. So uh, could you add something of that or explain how it's going on? I think if you look at opportunities we have, like when President Ramaphosa addresses the uh, G7, you know, this is showing us, it has laid bare the difficulties we have had over years in our development cooperation, where knowledge and technology transfer was always part of a package. But when it comes to implementation, there'll be cooperation around one or two projects, and this aspect has not been uh, taken seriously. Right now, we have been looking around at manufacturers in the South, and the, the, the picture is gloomy. Uh, so it, it really is no, it comes as no surprise. If then, if you are not a producer, you end up paying more in terms of uh, manufacturing, technology, logistics. Uh, by the time you, 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 you get the product, uh, you pay double the price that has been paid by other people. The big question for the world is how to respond in an equitable manner to the crisis we are in. The number of deaths emanating from COVID-19 are way too many. We cannot stick to our own way of doing things. Uh, we, we have to find alternative solutions. In South Africa, in the distribution of the vaccines, a uh, government has forged partnership with the private sector. Some of those who will be receiving and assisting with the distribution of the vaccines are leaders uh, of business, manufacturers and the private sector, because we think they, these are special 
these are special negotiations, negotiations of a special kind. Uh, as uh, my colleague, ba uh, Reverend Bafana was saying, we should not be purely driven uh, by uh, financial gains, but they should bring a human element in responding uh, to, to, to the pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, well, we, yes, Reverend. No, I just wanted to add on uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Mkise has said. Uh, I think one of the uh, exciting things for me as civil society uh, partner in South Africa is government had laid out a very clear criteria on how vaccines will be distributed. Um, and, and, and it's always around the primary need, you know, first with frontline workers, next will be the vulnerable and those that are over age, you know, next will be those with comorbidities and all of that. So there's a very clear <coughs> criteria that has been laid out and has been communicated widely with everybody. This is very useful because already we are seeing big companies wanting to go and negotiate for themselves and uh, their people and all of that, which obviously will mean people jumping the queue. Now, because this process is managed by government and they're ensuring through a very interesting app that ensures that people register and then you get a number that assures you when you will get the vaccine. It ensures that it's uh, you know equitable across, across the board. I think we will lose it if we allow, you know, companies that says, well, we have money, we want to buy, you, you, you then go to see apartheid vaccine because obviously those that have money will be first in line and the most vulnerable will be right at the end of the queue. With the current arrangement, with the clear criteria, it at least reassures everybody in the country that you know when your turn will come for you to get the vaccine and you need to apply through this app and then you get a code that tells you in which area nearer to where you live, you can access the vaccine as soon as it is available. And that system for me seems to be much more fairer and equitable. And, and we think we should maintain that. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend. Uh, and I think uh, this last reflection is um, a perfect one no? for close our, our webinar today because we are running out of time. But it was uh, a real pleasure for Fundación Alternativas having the opportunity to co-organize and co-host this event along with the Spanish uh, South African Embassy in Madrid, and particularly to have the opportunity to uh, listen to Dr. Mkise, uh, Fernando Fernandez Arias, and Reverend uh, Fana um, Kumalo. We have um, a last uh, opportunity now just after to um, listen or, or see a uh, last performance by two Nokwe and uh, youth group. So we will finish with that. But before that, um, I wanted to uh, pronounce once again the words that have been pronounced by Ambassador Mitinso. Uh, no one is safe until we are all safe. We need Ubuntu. So, well, let's work for that. And, uh, and continue uh, to work together to that end. Thank you very much. And it was a real pleasure. And thank you very much for your time.